The Avril Vulcan B Mark II defended the Cold War skies of England. Today we're going to take you through this freeware version for X-Plane 11, see what features the model has as well as how to fly it. Incidentally, this livery, X-Ray Hotel 558, is the first Mark II ever delivered to the RAF. It is also, sadly, the last Vulcan ever to fly. Special thanks goes out to Daniel G, the original creator of this as a payware aircraft. It was released to the xplane.org, who has allowed it to be freeware for all of us, as well as given permission to update it to Xplane 11. So let's jump in and figure out how we're going to fly it. The Vulcan's 3D cockpit has an accurate front panel with standard flight and engine instruments. The pilot and co-pilot both have consoles along their walls containing various system equipment that you would typically find in the overhead panel on an aircraft of this size, but we don't have an overhead. That center console contained the fuel pumps and autopilot. There's the uh, pilot's console. Throttles were in the normal place before the panel. We've got this neat pop-up here. It's colored. There is the pilot's console. Just repeated. You can bring it up. That way you can look out the window and see the front panel while accessing it. Since we're flying as a one-man crew on a five-man ship, uh, this is really a super feature. The yoke button at the bottom of that panel makes the uh, sticks for both the pilots disappear. Alright, so let's take a look around and see what else we've got. Up front is for the pilot and the co-pilot, obviously. Just aft of them, on a slightly lower deck actually, is a station for three people. The navigator for radar, the navigator plotter, and the air electronics officer. And there's a little bit of instrumentation here. In between the pilots and those uh, crew members is the crew hatch, which you just saw opening. We do have a few simulated instruments here. It's obviously pretty spartan compared to what the real one would have but you're probably not gonna come back and look at these anyway. I know I have not. And there are a few things up front that should not be there because they would not be in real life. But uh, again, this is X-Plane. We know it's gonna be a one-man crew. So you need some of the nav equipment up front. Going out the crew hatch, we've got a fantastic view of the uh, underside of this enormous Delta wing. The gear, the uh, front gear, is right there behind us. If we open the bomb bay, you're going to get a nice view of what appears to be a Yellow Sun Mark I nuclear weapon. Uh, if you want to do your accurate weight loads, this thing weighs 7,250 pounds and is capable of delivering a blast of 1.1 megatons. The aircraft comes with a number of fantastic liveries. The default here is X-Ray Hotel 558, which we've already mentioned was the last airworthy Vulcan, although a few are taxiable. It's been named the Spirit of Great Britain. Here we have X-Ray Hotel 560, which is a K2 tanker. The uh, XJ783 has the anti-flash white, which is the older style for a, you know, the flash of a nuclear bomb protecting it I guess somewhat and the original B1s had a straighter wing uh, most of the ones you'll see in white look that way XM598 at Goose Bay the original Black Buck aircraft and XM607 from Operation Black Buck which flew uh, sorties 1, 2, and 7 of that uh, very famous mission it was an incredible range for this aircraft to fly actually saved it from decommissioning for a few years all right, the Vulcan power-up procedure. Here we go. Step one, the battery on. At the co-pilot's console, which I've used the pop-up, you can see it's located right there. It's kind of a weird angle, so maybe we'll go look at it. You know, when you look from the uh, this angle, everything, the labels are readable. So the battery's right there. Punch that red button, and you will get power. Step two, engine fuel cutoffs. Let's bring up that fuel pedestal. You see it actually moves. It actually leaves the, the seats and flies up here. 
we're just going to flick these bottom row switches, all four of them for the four engines. And then all of these other pumps, uh, the switches move, but it doesn't do anything. And you see they fly back on me. I can't actually leave them there. We have some transfer switches. I don't know if they operate either, but they do let you move it. Just note down here's the autopilot panel. We'll use that extensively later when we go to fly. Now let's activate the powered flight controls. These are going to be located on our pilots panel. You can glance down. It's pretty easy to get to it. Uh, there's individual systems with the toggle switches by the armrest. Or up here at the top of that row or column, if you will, is one red button that fires them all up. You'll notice the orange indicator lights showing that is powered on. Now the second time I did it, the yaw damper didn't come on for some reason, uh, but you can note that last switch is the yaw damper. This one is actually kind of easier to do from the pop-up because you can see it well, so that's another way you could do it. So powered flight controls. APU start. Uh, I believe I've started this aircraft without using the APU, but that doesn't make any sense. So let's start the APU. It's a two position toggle. So we're gonna rotate it two clicks to the right. You'll hear it power up. And then the APU is running. All right, next up, we've got our nav light indications right over here beside the APU. So let's turn those on. It's labeled as nav, but it's basically two red uh, rotating beacons on the underbelly and they look pretty cool so I'm gonna leave those on. Other switches we have here are the crew hatch right there by the battery. You can actually access that by pressing uh, shift F2 and I'll toggle it open and closed. The bomb bay we talked about earlier, uh, shift F1 toggles the bomb bay or there's the switch on the pilot's console. There's also some other bomb functions, but I'm not going to go into that. It is in the documentation. So let's start our engine start procedure. Since we have the APU running now, we would have bleed air, so that's actually possible. We're going to open the pilot's console from this little pop-up tab. And I like to move it so I can also see the engine gauges during startup. So the starters are on the bottom of the console. We're going to flick on all four igniters and leave them on. Once we've done that, let's take a little peek over here. We need to turn these on. I'm not certain what they are. If you don't turn them on, the uh, N1 gauges will not operate correctly and the engine sounds will be weird. However, uh, I have been able to power up the ship without them, so I don't really know exactly what those do. It would make sense to me if maybe they were a bleed or something. I, I don't know really what happened there. It's, it's strange. Just turn them on. All right, next, let's take a look at these gauges, make sure we know what we're looking at. They're in the standard columns, one, two, three, and four. In the top row is your exhaust gas temperature. That'll let you know we've started. The N1s are gonna be a little wonky. For some reason, they're all linked to engine number one. So when we start up one, you're gonna see them all come on. And the oiled gauges seem to work correctly. So, at the pilot's console, press and hold number one. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter how long you hold it for. You get a nice long, maybe a 20, 30 second start sound. You can see the exhaust gas temperature coming up and absolutely nothing happening on the N1. Just kind of a weird quirk here. The N1 at idle reads zero. As soon as you give it even the slightest nudge on the throttle, that N1 is gonna start bouncing around. And the starter has a really nice cutout sound there. Alright, so that N1 is reading zero, as I mentioned. So let's crack the throttle. See, it jumps up and the uh, fine indicator really spins quite wildly. And you notice two, three, and four are also moving. I guess we've kind of covered up four. Here, let's go out. So engine one is the only started engine. All the others are off. Two, three, and four are moving exactly parallel to one. So again, just some little bug. It's not really that important. I don't think it's gonna give you any issues. Just don't want you to be confused when you find it. So we go outside, you can see one is running. Not too much in the way of graphics looking down the uh, exhaust nozzles. All right, starting two, same deal. 
Hold down the starter as long as you care to. Watch for your engine gauges. Exhaust gas temperature should rise. If it won't start, make sure you uh, check that those fuel pumps are on on the fuel panel. We did that earlier. And uh, of course, make sure there's fuel in the aircraft. When I started filming this, I had uh, been flying around with it a whole bunch, and then for whatever reason, I started it up one day and it was empty. And I sat here wondering what on earth I was forgetting trying to start engines with no fuel. So don't do that. So three and four, Let's get those going. It's a pretty satisfying startup procedure. It's not very complicated, but the you know the sounds really add to it. All right, the EGT on number four is coming up. It looks like just about stable, so we can get ready to go here and maybe look at our flight plan in a moment. Few other little features we'll take a peek at here. Uh, you'll notice the yokes do move, and that's pretty accurate to the real ones from what I've seen in videos. You can hide them if they're in your way. There are some other features in the co-pilots. Uh, I'm not going to list them all. You can look at the documentation. There's a pressure setting there. We're not going that high today. We do have landing lights, so go ahead and flick those on. They're ganged, so you press one, you get them both. These only come on if the gear is down, so you can actually leave them in the on position and you won't see them until the gear is down. Kind of interesting. We do have working wipers. Uh, you know, this cockpit leaves a lot to be desired in visibility, but it is kind of neat to see three wipers up there and they're all linked together. Low and high speed and you can look from outside. By the way, your yoke actually controls both pilots' heads. So if you want something fun to do, go out look in the window and shake the yoke and they uh, they look all over wherever you turn the yoke to. Alright so back in our main panel I'm gonna hide the yoke so you can check out this HSI. Your heading select knob moves that red needle and that's you know just ignore the background cards. Uh, see spinning the OBS here I can change the number so this might make you a little bit insane. If you've turned that OBS and you want to find a specific heading you don't have really numbers to reference off of unless you turn the OBS back to uh, north. So just remember that the red arrow for heading has nothing to do with your um, radio nav card that I'm spinning there. And the localizer and glide slope stuff does show up on your uh, artificial horizon. So here in the center panel we've got another nav display. It's, a, it's supposed to be a tack and It just points to the VOR. And you've got a scrolling DME it's kind of neat. Uh, this is, here's your drag chute. Don't pull it until you're on the ground. I was uh, floating the one day, came in a little hot, pulled it just a few feet off the ground, but it really plunked us down and the aircraft caught on fire. So don't do that. Under your fuel panel, we've got the autopilot and you are going to want to use this. I have not found a trim on this aircraft. I think it's just a quirk of this uh, the sim. I'm sure the real one had to have trim. Can't imagine it didn't. So if you don't use autopilot, you're going to go crazy holding it. The auto throttles over here on the pilot's panel. So set the number and turn it on from there. Your uh, nav radios, you get them from the pop-up. All your radios are on this one thing. So change the mode, ADF, nav, and comm. Uh, up there by the digit display are your adjustment knobs for it. If you're using ADF, the indicator is going to be over on the co-pilot side see way, way over there so that's what points to it don't mess around with that uh, HSI that's not going to indicate it so I've grabbed a few select stops from the Vulcans final tour this is the southern route it went a lot more places and it did not land where we are landing so departing Doncaster we're going to fly to CWZ which is uh, what is that Cranwell from Cranwell to Wittering, then down to Barkway. Next will be to Lambourne. Then we're going to tune up and fly towards Rochester, but we are not actually going to make it. So that very acute angle down there, it's not going to happen. So we'll zoom in here in a minute because uh, we'll, we're going to want to turn over there to London City. I just picked this for fun because it's great to take the Vulcan into London. Uh, 
The London City Airport is really not appropriate for this aircraft, but I made it work. So here we go. After we hit um, Lamb up there, we're going to dial up Rochester 369, and then you're going to fly down to the Thames River. When you get to the river, turn... You can dial up London City at uh, 322 on the ADF. That'll help guide you in. But it's pretty much going to be a low and slow visual. You definitely want to slow this thing down way in advance. All right. Uh, I'm using the pop-out Garmin 430. I have an external that has a pop-out button. You might be able to set a hotkey. I didn't see it in the ship or in the documentation but it's going to be a great resource. Put in the flight plan and then you've got a nice backup reference. I'm sure uh, X-Ray Hotel 558 during its tour days was using a GPS, so I don't feel like this is cheating at all. However, I don't think you can actually make the aircraft navigate um, via autopilot with the GPS. I uh, wasn't able to make that work. I might have just missed something. So. We're going to start taxiing, and in a, in a moment, I'm going to cut out a part of the turn because it was painfully long and awful. It doesn't have the best turn performance. You can see there, we just jumped, and now we're 180 around. And you see the speed we're going now? That's about the minimum speed that it actually kind of sort of turns okay. At a very low speed, it's not going to want to turn at all. So uh, get it rolling. Start planning ahead for your turns don't slow down too much uh, other things that might be helpful I use tow brakes I found that very helpful to help navigate the turns you might be able to get away with uh, variable thrust if you have throttles that differentiate the engines I've only got one throttle on my uh, Thrustmaster here so I'm stuck with all four and I'm not gonna look down and try and move those with the mouse so at a couple of these angles, if you watch the nose gear, you might notice that uh, the trajectory on the ground doesn't match that of the wheels. It's kind of sliding a bit. I think you'll see it in the next shot. So uh, that might annoy you a little bit. It is manageable. It's doing it right now, actually. See the way the wheels turn? It's not quite tracking where it should. I don't know if that's just a, a setup thing where it's not thinking there's enough pressure in that front wheel to steer correctly. So let's line up here. Beautiful reflection on that skin. Great texture. Uh, live traffic is going to annoy us. They're coming in. So let's wait a minute for that. Winds were, uh, you know, calm when I filmed this, so it wasn't really an issue there. All right, this night takeoff is from a different flight because I'm a goofball and didn't actually get the takeoff for today's recorded for some reason. But it looks great at night, so let's check it out. We're going to rotate anywhere between 135 knots and 165. Just depends on the weight. It pretty much floats off the runway, so when you start to rotate, you're just going to feel like it just whoof, became airborne. I think that's mostly the, that nice big wing. So I brought out the uh, airspeed indicator. Sorry, I lost the bottom of it. Um, that's because in the, the recording it was actually clipped. So we're passing 130, 140, 50, probably about 155, and we are up. You notice I didn't really have to roll the nose back too much there. These are Rolls-Royce Olympus uh, engines, which is an older variant of that found in Concord. Absolutely beautiful aircraft. The documentation says that our climb speed should be about 250 knots. For today's little tour, here we are, back to our tour, uh, set up the autopilot, we're doing sightseeing. So I'm flying us all low level because uh, that's really what they would be doing to show off the Vulcan. So here comes our second waypoint, Wittering at uh, 117.6 it's quite a sight I mean the aircraft is such a huge wing it just really lends itself to uh, air show duty just uh, so much to look at there and I really love its uh, camo it just looks great so we'll double check with our GPS if you want something neat to look up, uh, Aston Martin has a Vulcan car, 
and there's at least one that's been painted up in that uh, Vulcan bomber paint scheme and uh, it looks good on the bomber it looks just as good or better on an Aston Martin all right so I'm just gonna continue with the flight just uh, to show you that radio nav is possible it's um, might be a little daunting to you if you're not quite sure how to use VORs and ADFs and you can turn on this uh, it's really the radio ident for the nav and that's what you'll hear that beeping it's a morse code you can look on the plate and see what it should be and that way you're sure you have the correct transmitter you don't really need to use that here's our ground flyby As you can see from about 3,000 feet just a huge profile well, what a sight this thing must have been uh, definitely go look up x-ray hotel 558's history and the uh, Vulcan to the Sky project. I mean, it's grounded now, but it, it's amazing how they acquired it, how they brought it back, and all the tours it did. It really uh, has a fantastic history. All right, so just some checking in on the map there, some nice externals. Again, it looks good at every angle. When the light hit it, hits it, it looks even better. All right, coming up on BKY for Barkway. should be our heading mode there, that track that I'm clicking on and off. So we can adjust the heading again down on the HSI with that uh, red needle, the bottom right knob will adjust that. Again, a little bit annoying, we don't have any digits unless I spin it back to uh, north on the card. We don't have any digits to align it to. I, I don't really know what's up with that. I don't really think that's the way the real Vulcan would have been. The documentation notes a lot of the nav equipment uh, should be in the back for other crew members so maybe the pilot really wasn't messing with that too much at all up here. So I do believe uh, this was flown in an altitude hold. I'm recording our voiceover after the fact here. Uh, just something to note with this this big of a wing it's easy to over control it and it's uh, interesting to see how well the autopilot can actually maintain level you notice we had a bit of a dive in the turn and now it's climbing so the uh, actual route on this southern tour would have uh, taken us from Doncaster past RAF Waddington to Rutland Water which is a reservoir next off to Northweld Airfield and Gravesend uh, there's a ton more stops but we're not really going to be making any of them because we're gonna dip out to London City it's gonna be a pretty exciting approach the airfields pretty small be honest this is one of very few aircraft I almost spend as much time outside as inside because it just looks so good uh, you might have noticed earlier we had the pressurization panel I do believe in one of my test flights I took this up to an altitude where you would be pressurized and uh, I don't think I had set that and I don't think we had any issues so just something to be aware of that you might need to set it since I believe this was originally for um, X-Plane 10 and got ported over and updated, I think that's where you get a lot of the weird little quirks, possibly the uh, N1s all being linked together and having some other switches that seemingly don't do anything. Now as much as these simulated flybys look great, I'm sure we're nowhere near close of the actual sound of the Vulcan flyover would have been. It just had to be an incredible noise. Uh, one thing to note, since we're cruising around down here at about uh, 3,000, uh, like 2,500 at the moment, our fuel burn on these four Rolls-Royce Olympus is going to be out of this world. 
So when I had set up the fuel before this flight, uh, I think X-Plane said we had about three hours of fuel on board. And you're watching the whole flight uninterrupted here, and you can probably see the uh, video slider. We're not that far from the end. And we're going to chew through a lot of the fuel. So depending on what you plan on doing with your Vulcan bomber, definitely keep an eye on the fuel and make sure you do some good fuel planning. So if you're not too familiar with how the uh, VORs work, basically you're going to tune up one of those ground-based stations. You'll turn the OBS until the needle lines up with that center line. And then as you're flying, the needle will deflect to the left or right if you get off course from the radial. The radial would have been the specific direction you were coming in. And that actually allows you to come in at a, at a precise heading. So for example, if we're headed to an airport and there's a VOR, we could know we were on the correct heading relative to that ground station. It's really not so different from the GPS. Oh, here's our fuel check. Again, I think I started with uh, three hours of fuel, and now we're down to 110 by its estimate. We've got the GPS map. But you see, we've got the magenta line on the GPS. So if you're doing the VORs, it's more in your head. The flight planning is more important. You have to look at all these radio stations. Uh, I suggest you put it in sky vector. OK, it looks like we're approaching our Thames turn. So it'll just be all visual. So we're flying towards uh, Rochester, but we will be turning. All right, I'm going to go direct to on London City here just to clear Rochester out since we will not actually uh, pass by it. Ahead of us, out the, uh, the windscreen, the limited view we have, you can probably see the Thames already. Let's zoom in there. Now it's a little easier to see it. The uh, visibility is going to certainly be an issue here. And something I should mention, you can probably see on top of the wings, um, just behind of the engines, just aft of the uh, engine intakes, I should say, there's some rectangular sort of cutouts on the top marked in yellow. Those are the air brakes. They deploy from the top and the bottom. And uh, if you haven't slowed down enough, you'll definitely need them. You can see we're looking at ADF now to get London City in front of us. you notice I'm spinning the OBS on the VOR and nothing's happening because again, ADFs do not register on the VOR. So I'm going to try and give you multiple angles here. I'll be entirely honest, it was a real pain to land. Look at this pilot's view. Uh, London City is actually in sight if you're looking just above the cockpit bubble in the external, you can see the uh, strip of ground where it's located. But if you look at the uh, pilot's panel, you really can't see much of anything. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really a terrible vantage point. So we've got gear down at this point. We're going to try and get ourselves slowed down to around 135, which uh, again, that was about our rotate speed. It doesn't slow down very quickly, so I've got the gear out. I was already throttling back ahead of time. Looks like we're down about 140 right now, and I'm really just trying to ease in because I've had a couple hot landings, and it just doesn't bleed speed fast enough. Moved over to the co-pilot seat because I can actually kind of see the field from there a little bit better. But again, generally speaking, the visibility is kind of awful. Uh, I do believe that is very accurate to the real Vulcan. I had read in one source that they had a, some sort of periscope for ground handling and taxiing, but uh, I've never seen that in any of the videos or anything. Now one issue I'm having here, I'm, I'm coming in, I'm going to try and clean up the spine a little bit and turn, but I drift a little bit past the runway heading. And at this low speed, it's just a little bit sloppy. You see, I can't quite get it to hold there. So I'm going to have to compensate a little bit more. I will tell you, this landing uh, should definitely be a go-around. So 
brace yourself. You've probably seen a couple uh, garbage landings from me in the past. And uh, again, I just wanted to show you how to operate this Vulcan. I'm not going to claim that this is how you should land it. I will certainly say this is not how you should land it. And this is actually not where you should land it. But it is going to be fun. All right, so I'm still trying to correct my course. You'll notice I can almost see it out the pilot's window now. One big benefit we have, we do have that drag chute. So once we touch down, we will be able to deploy that to dump the remaining speed. Uh, I can't quite see my airspeed indicator as I'm recording the voiceover, but I believe we're down about the 135, 140 we want to be at. It's very interesting since we don't have an empennage, you know, we essentially have just the one big wing and our vertical stabilizer with the rudder and just the, the handling is so different than with the traditional configuration. All right, that was garbage, but we are down. So next, let's pull that drag chute so we don't end up in the Thames on the other end. It's kind of neat to get outside and see the drag chute. Not something uh, very common, and I'm not even sure if any modern military aircraft still use a drag chute, but uh, highly, highly common in the uh, early jet age. Pretty much all the aircraft were uh, very, very heavy and sometimes had some very high landing speeds. I don't believe the Vulcan has to use the drag chute. I'm just using it now. I have not seen it uh, in any of the videos I've watched. I'm going to use a little bit of time uh, compression to get us in here to a taxiing. I told you at the beginning of this flight, it's just kind of a bear to taxi and uh, this was no exception. So uh, London City obviously would have never had a Vulcan bomber. It's a very small airport just more for convenience due to its location. But it sure was fun to fly right in here so close to London. We could have continued for a moment and uh, ended up at Heathrow. London City is basically in the uh, approach or departure for Heathrow, depending on the flow. So there we are, and you can see those uh, air brake on the top of the wing right there. All right, let's wrap this video up. We're gonna just check out a few more things inside for a uh, power down. We can open that uh, crew hatch again with Shift F2. If you want to see the bomb bay again, that was Shift F1, or we showed you where the switch is here on the co-pilots. We can turn off our uh, nav light slash beacons. Quick fuel check. Notice it says 32 minutes estimated flight time. Last time we looked was 1.10, and we finished this flight in real time. I have not really edited out any of the, uh, the flight there. So that's obviously not the amount of flight time we did. So I think it's the low altitude. I haven't tried a long one. Quick check of the nav equipment. This is your ADF. If you spin it, the card moves, the numbers go upside down. That's a little weird looking. But uh, you're going to need that ADF. This is not a magenta line aircraft. The center one, that's going to point to your VOR. So at the very least, that one's actually probably the easiest to use. Just fly where that's showing and you're going to get to your next waypoint. Your heading on this OBS card, oh sorry, the HSI card, uh, spin the OBS, it turns, that needle would deflect if you're a little more familiar with how VORs work. Uh, there's your heading, the red one. So when that turns, again, we don't have numbers, that's a little bit aggravating, but you can get close and then fine tune it as you go. All right, so to power off the uh, engines, we're just going to turn off the fuel supply. So let's move over here again. Oops, that was the yoke. Let's pop back up the fuel panel. Remember we did this at the beginning. We turned on the four switches that actually work on that fuel panel. Turn them off and you've cut the uh, fuel to the engines. See the exhaust gas temperature is spooling down. And in other housekeeping, you can pretty much uh, turn off the igniters. Anything else we turned on in here, you can run through and turn back off. 
guess I'll at least do the battery for you. All right, so we have uh, powered down the ship. Now it's time to go down the crew hatch. And uh, welcome to London. So I really hope you've enjoyed this uh, quick tutorial and look at the Vulcan bomber. Again, it's free, highly recommend it. You've got nothing to lose. Uh, look up the history of X-Ray Hotel 558. It's fascinating. The last Vulcan to fly. This is the Flight Brothers. If you like this video, please subscribe, check out the channel, join us in the live stream and comment, and remember, plan the flight and fly the plan.